Hello again, this is Lawrence Holgate, the host of Understanding Plato and the author of the book of the same name. Today's episode is a continuation. This is episode eight, by the way. It's a continuation of the dialogue that we started last week called Mino, the uh, fourth book in the Socratic Dialogue series. We've already talked about the trouble that uh, Socrates has had in giving a definition of an adequate definition or getting an adequate definition of virtue. Mino makes two attempts, both of them fail. So Socrates now switches the topic to the question, can virtue be taught? And if uh, you have the book in front of you, I'm in section 5.5, that is chapter 5, section 5, uh, 5.5, it has the title, Can Virtue Be Taught? After a long digression about the possibility of inquiry to a question to which we're going to um, return in uh, a later section, Socrates grudgingly agrees that he will investigate by hypothesis the question whether virtue is or is not acquired by teaching. His consent to do this is grudging because he does not think that any question about virtue can be answered until we first find out what virtue is. The hypothesis he investigates is that virtue is some kind of knowledge, and he formulates the first part of his argument with a hypothetical. If virtue is some sort of knowledge, it clearly would be acquired by teaching. Now, Socrates makes short work of this hypothesis. Uh, It goes in five steps. Step one, if virtue is knowledge, it is acquired by teaching. That's the hypothesis. If virtue is acquired by teaching, then there are teachers and learners of virtue. That would be an empirical uh, statement. There must be teachers of virtue, but then in step three, he says, there are no teachers or learners of virtue. Therefore, putting one, two, and three together, we get step four, therefore, virtue is not acquired by teaching. Therefore, virtue is not knowledge. So he starts out with the hypothetical, if virtue is knowledge, if it's, I'm sorry, if virtue is knowledge, it is acquired by teaching. That's the hypothetical. He, he says flatly, uh, no one, there are no teachers of virtue. Therefore, it's not acquired by teaching. Therefore, virtue is not knowledge. It's a valid argument if, in the sense that if we accept the, the premises, then we must accept the conclusion. But are the premises true? Is all knowledge acquired by teaching? as he states in premise one. Premise three is also questionable. It's an empirical claim. The premise three, by the way, is there are no teachers or learners of virtue. He just flatly says that. But that's an empirical claim. And as such, it has to be supported by observation and experience. Socrates does not believe that there is any evidence that, quote, good men, whether now or in the past, also know how to pass on to someone else this virtue that makes them good men. He attempts to prove it by giving examples of famous Athenians and contemporary educators for hire. They were called sophists, by the way, S-O-P-H-I-S-T. These were people who claim these are people in Athens who claim that they can teach virtue to young people. In all of these cases, Socrates says that these so-called teachers not only disagree among themselves about whether virtue can be taught, but they're not even agreed to know it themselves. We should note that Socrates is not saying that it is logically impossible that there are any teachers or learners of virtue. He's not saying it would be a contradiction to say that. What he's saying is that there is no empirical basis for believing that such persons exist. He's never seen them, have you? He's challenging us to say, no, we, we don't know that there are people who can teach virtue. This conclusion leaves Socrates with a problem. He's aware that some political leaders have made the correct choices when guiding their cities. But how is this possible if these leaders do not have knowledge of virtue? Socrates' answer to this question is that they have true beliefs about achieving their goals. I'll I'll repeat that. They may not have knowledge, but they do have true beliefs about achieving their goals. He he uses an analogy 
to help us distinguish between knowledge and true belief. And here's my take on the analogy. Suppose that I live deep in the woods. I know the road to take to get to my house, and I could easily guide others to get to my house because I've taken that road many times. I know how to get to my house. But suppose you've never been to my house and you have no first-hand experience of the roads in the area, so you make a guess about the correct road. And you tell others about this, and they take that road that you recommend, and they find my house. Your guess, that is your belief about how to get to my house, turns out to be correct. Socrates says that as long as you have a correct belief about what I have knowledge of, you are no worse a guide than me, even though you have only true beliefs, not knowledge. If true belief is just as beneficial as knowledge, then how do they differ? How does knowledge differ from true belief? Socrates says that true belief is not tied down by reasoning and the explanation. It's not tied down by reasoning and the explanation. What he means is that the person who has a belief about the way to get to my house but has never been there does not have an explanation for her belief. She's unable to give us a good reason for saying that, it, that going in one direction is better than going in another, even though her belief happens to be true. She's just made a guess, a lucky guess, we say. Knowledge, however, is tied down by reasons. I know the way to my house because I've been on the road many times. I, can, I am able to explain why the road that I choose is the correct road. This is why if we are to choose between guides for a camping trip, in the mountains, surely we would prefer someone who's made that trip several times rather than someone who must guess about the correct trails to take to our destination. Am I right? We would not take as our guide someone who's never been to where he's guiding us, or so-called, he's just guessing. When correct belief guides the outcome of each action is no worse than what knowledge does. That's a quote from the original Mino, from the original dialogue. When correct belief guides, the outcome of each action is no worse than when knowledge guides. So the ruler of a city who makes correct decisions does not rule on the basis of knowledge, but on the basis of correct beliefs. And this is just as beneficial for the citizens of the city as if the ruler were to rule from knowledge. And Socrates observes that good rulers, he says, they're like soothsayers and prophets who are inspired by the god when they achieve success in saying many great things while knowing nothing about the things they say. He concludes that virtue is not acquired by nature, not acquired by teaching, but it comes to be present through divine dispensation without understanding and those in whom it does come to be present. They're all making luck, lucky guesses. Why does Socrates jump to the conclusion, though, that virtue comes to be present through divine dispensation? That's a curious thing for him to say, isn't it? Well, to answer that question, we have to return to the digression that is forced by a paradox mentioned earlier by Mino. It, and this is called Mino's Paradox. After repeated failures to provide Socrates with an adequate definition of virtue, Mino complains that Socrates may not be able to inquire about virtue at all. And here's the paradox. If we know what virtue is, then there's no need to inquire about virtue. If we don't know what virtue is, then even if you do happen to bump right into it, how do you know that it's the thing you did not know? That's the paradox. You either know what virtue is or you don't know. If you do know what it is, then there's no point in going on to inquire about it. But if you don't know what it is, how would you recognize that you, recognize that you came across the correct definition? Socrates rephrases Mino's complaint as follows. And this is a direct quote again from the original Mino, the original book, the original dialogue. Quote, it is not possible for a person to inquire about what he knows or about what he does not know. After all, he wouldn't inquire about what he knows. 
once he knows it, then there's no need to inquire about something like that. Nor can he inquire about what he does not know, since he does not know what he is to inquire about. We might all agree that if we already know the definition of virtue, then there is no need to inquire about the definition. But it's the second option that troubles us. If we do not know what virtue is, then how are we to go about our inquiry? How will we know when we have found correct or incorrect answers to our question about the nature of virtue? It's like being told to find the length of the third side of a triangle. And let's suppose that the third side of a triangle has a perimeter of 50 centimeters with two sides equal in length, and the third side having a length that is more than five times that of the equal sides. I know if you're not into geometry, you're not going to understand what the heck Socrates just said. This is Socrates' um, example uh, in the book. But how are we to know the correct answer when we, when we come across it? We wouldn't if, if we already know the answer, of course, we wouldn't inquire. But if we don't know the answer, how do we know we'd, when we get it correctly? This would happen in any math problem, by the way. You don't have to choose your own math problem. So Socrates accepts the challenge, the challenge of solving this puzzle, of solving the paradox. And the solution is called the theory of recollection. The paradox is Mino's paradox about knowledge. And the reply to the paradox, the solution of the paradox, is the theory of recollection. So Socrates accepts the challenge. He responds by making a number of claims. Let's look at these claims by using the following strategy, the one I've already recommended in all the previous dialogues. You begin by locating the main conclusion of the argument that the author advances, that is, whatever it is that the author is attempting to prove. Try to find that. And next, you identify the reasons provided by the author for the conclusion reached, showing how the author moves from these reasons to the conclusion that you've already identified. And this prepares the groundwork for any criticism you want to make. Does the philosopher succeed? Is the proof logically sound? Are the premises true? Do the premises actually support the conclusion? Those are the questions that you're going to come up with in critical thinking. Finally, we might want to show how we would answer the same question, taking care to state the reasons that we think support an alternative solution. Now listen to this. Listen to the steps that Socrates uses in an example. Here's the main conclusions that Socrates advances in the ensuing dialogue. Now get hang on here, because he's going to try to prove that the soul is immortal. That seems to take us way off the track, but he's going to go to that conclusion, the soul is immortal. Now how in the heck did he get there? Let's go back, let's find the premises uh, for that uh, this astounding uh, argument. Uh, maybe not astounding to many, a lot of people believe that the soul is immortal meaning that the soul will never cease to exist. It's always there. Step one, if learning something new is unnecessary or impossible, as proved by Mino's paradox, then it must be that what we mistakenly think we are learning for the first time is actually something we already know, and we're merely recollecting what we already know. That's the theory of recollection. The, the, the way that we can do this we, the way we can ex escape the, the paradox is just assume that we already know what it is we're pursuing by recollecting what we already know. If Step two, if we're re recollecting what we already know, then we either acquired that knowledge we are recollecting in this life or we acquired it in a previous life. Now, here we go. Step three, there's no evidence that we acquired the knowledge in this life. Step four, therefore, we must have acquired what we know in a life we lived previous to this life. Step five, if we lived a previous life, then we lived it, then we must have lived in a disembodied soul. He offers no proof for that at all. 
Step six, the soul is immortal. That is, if it's the soul, then it'll never cease to exist. It must always exist.